glory to Jesus Christ. I cross out there. There we are. Today is Thursday, the, the Annunciation, the Feast of the Annunciation. And the Thursday of the fifth week of Lent. March 25th, or as we say here in Boston, March. March 25th, 2021. And we're doing the UCAT today. And then at the end, we'll do one of the seven last words of Christ on the cross. And let's pray our prayer for the Holy Spirit in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that, by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> the Annunciation of the Lord, Solemnity. At the Annunciation, St. Gabriel the Archangel told the Blessed Virgin Mary that she would be the mother of the Son of God. She gave her fiat, let it be done, upon which she conceived the Savior, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Christians find meaning in this dialogue in which the Mother of God appears so great because of her humility. Because of her consent to God's word, she participated in the redemptive work of her Son, Jesus Christ. She is Mother of Christ and of each Christian. O God, who willed that your word should take on the reality of human flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary, Grant, we pray, that we who confess our Redeemer to be God and man may merit to become partakers even in his divine nature, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. The Annunciation to Mary inaugurates the fullness of time, the time of the fulfillment of God's promises and preparations. Mary was invited to conceive him in whom the whole fullness of deity would dwell bodily. The divine response to her question, how can this be since I know not man, was given by the power of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 484. And we were looking at the virtues, but now we're looking at the vices on page 179, question 318. What are vices? Vices are negative habits that deaden and dull the conscience, incline a person to evil, and habitually prepare him to sin. <clears throat> so just as virtues are the habit of doing a particular good, so a vice is the habit of doing a particular evil. Human vices are found in connection with the capital sins. Pride, which is arrogance. Avarice, greed. Envy, which isn't just jealousy, but seeks to do harm. Anger, which uncontrolled is wrath or rage and uh, leads to violence and at least violence in word, if not violence in action, lust in all its forms, gluttony and sloth, or acadia, or acedia, which is defined here as spiritual boredom, which is uh, uh, turning from the spiritual because it's... Uh, the carnal is more interesting, or it can just be blotting it out for whatever reason. If there were no forgiveness of sins in the church, there would be no hope for eternal life and eternal deliverance. Let us thank God who gave his church such a great gift, that's St. Augustine. 
3.19 Are we responsible for the sins of other people? No, we are not. Not responsible for other people's sins. Unless we are guilty of misleading or seducing another person to sin, or of cooperating in it, or encouraging someone else to sin, or of neglecting to offer a timely warning or, or our help. So there are times in which saying something is counterproductive. But there are many times that we miss, and often out of cowardice, or uh, can't, we can't be bothered to get a negative response from the person. But that's often what a person needs. The, the tough love uh, often has to exercise that prophetic function of pointing out sin. And... Uh, not uh, cooperating with it. 320. Is there such a thing as structures of sin? Structures of sin exist only in a manner of speaking. Sin is always connected with an individual person who knowingly and willingly agrees to something evil. Nevertheless, there are societal situations and institutions that are so contrary to God's commandments that we can speak about structures of sin. Yet these two are the consequences of personal sin. So both virtue and vice are in our power. But when the deed is in our power, so is the omission. And when we can say no, we can also say yes. So that sounds very Christian, a very but that was from Aristotle, who died in 322 BC. Chapter 2. Can a Christian be a radical individualist? So, um, there are those who think that, you know, you can just live for yourself and not care about anybody else. But that is not the Christian way. Even a hermit is not to do that. We have to care for others. We're all connected with the body of Christ. With it. There's no such thing as a Jesus and me relationship that isolates from everybody else. That's uh, a delusion. No, a Christian can never be a radical individualist. Because man is by nature designed for fellowship. That is, uh, communion with other people, service of other people, interaction with other people. Every person has a mother and a father. He receives help from others and is obliged to help others and to develop his talents for the benefit of all. Because uh, we uh, couldn't survive without other people. Some people think that they're rugged individualists and can do it. You know, I can go off and live in the, the Yukon or something and trap and, and uh, survive. Well, maybe you could. But the, uh, that's, but you have that obligation, if you're a Christian, of helping others in some way according to your abilities. And to develop talents for the benefit of all, not just for oneself, but for others. Since man is God's image, in a certain way he reflects God, who in his depth is not alone, but triune, and thus life, love, dialogue, and exchange. Finally, love is the central commandment for all Christians. Through it, we profoundly belong together and are fundamentally dependent on one another you shall love your neighbor as yourself matthew 22 39 which is quoting from the torah even if you are not afraid to fall alone how can you presume that you will rise up alone. Consider, two together can accomplish more than one alone. St. John of the Cross. What is more important, society or the individual? 322. In God's sight, every individual matters in the first place as a person, and only then as a social being. So we're, we're not ants in an anthill. We are individuals before God. 
And if one individual needed the incarnation, life and death and resurrection of Christ, Jesus would have gone through that just for that one person. In God's sight, every individual matters in the first place as a person, and only then as a social being. So yeah, it's your first as you, and then as you in, in connection with other people. But uh, as, as an individual, you don't exist in isolation. Men may never be means to a social end. So that's the, in the prominent structure, they say, well, people are cogs in this machine. And that's, and, and the individual has no value except for social value, for the advancement of, of the party. But that isn't true. Every individual, including those that are considered uh, not productive, are of infinite value before God and should be of infinite value to us. Social institutions such as the state and the family are necessary for the individual. They even respond to his nature and family as a, as a unit of reality uh, is more important than the state. The state is important, but the state in many ways exists to enhance the family and for the application of individual rights. How can the individual, this is on page 181, how can the individual be integrated into society in such a way that he nevertheless can develop freely? The individual can develop freely in society if the principle of subsidiarity is observed. The principle of subsidiarity, which was developed as part of Catholic social teaching, states, what individuals can accomplish by their own initiative and efforts should not be taken from them by a higher authority. So uh, if something can, uh, can be done on a, a, a more local level than it should be, or if something can be done by individual or a few individuals, rather than have it completely orchestrated by the state, which is what totalitarian governments say, that the state is the all, even though the communists say, oh, we want the state to wither away. That is exactly the last thing they want. A greater and higher social institution must not take over the duties of a subordinate organization or deprive it of its competence. Its purpose, rather, is to intervene in the subsidiary fashion, that is, offering help so that uh, things can be done uh, freely by individuals and by individual groups and by families and by uh, villages and neighborhoods and the like. When individuals or smaller institutions find that a task is beyond them. So it's interesting that the, our country is the United States. It isn't a mass of something. Each state has its integrity. Each community has its integrity. Three twenty-four. On what principles does society uh, is is a society built? Every society builds on a hierarchy of values that is put into practice through justice and love. That's the way it's supposed to. But what is the hierarchy of values of the particular society? Um, they, it's they've always been defective, but sometimes they're worse than others. And now we seem to be going into uh, an even more retrograde stage of uh, individual uh, and of uh, natural law, viewing natural law, and application of rights and duties. Because remember, if there are rights, there are duties. No society can last unless it is based on a clear orientation toward values, values that are principles. I prefer the uh, use of the word principles rather than values, because values tend to have a, a subjective overtone, while principles are objective, that are reflected in a just ordering of relationships and an active implementation of this justice. 
So any uh, mode of slavery has to be opposed, even if the term isn't used. Thus, man may never be made into a means to an end of social action. Every society needs constant conversion from unjust structures. Ultimately, this is accomplished only by love, the greatest social commandment. Because often with violent revolution, uh, the opposite happens. Uh, it, uh, usually, you look at the French Revolution, for example. Was it an improvement? In theory, it could have been. It could have been very much an improvement, but it was the opposite. It was a bloodbath and an oppression. And look and look at the communist revolutions. Their the result has been uh, always profoundly negative, enslaving. Ultimately, this is accomplished only by love, the greatest social commandment. It respects others. It demands justice. And it makes conversion from inequitable conditions possible. 325. What is the basis for authority in society? Every society relies on a legitimate authority to ensure that it is orderly, cohesive, and smooth running and to promote its development. But often in history, we've seen that the opposite, so the people in power use their power to oppress the others, rather than to serve the others, they exploit the others. It is in keeping with human nature as created by God that men allow themselves to be governed by legitimate authority. Pope John Paul II wrote, the Church values the democratic system in as much as it ensures the participation of citizens in making political choices and guarantees to the governed the possibility both of electing and holding accountable those who govern them and of replacing them through peaceful means when appropriate. On page 182, of course, an authority in society must never originate in the raw usurpation of power, but must have legitimacy under law. Who rules and what form of government is appropriate are left to the will of the citizens. The church is not committed to particular forms of government, but only says that they must not contradict the common good. So often, many people thought that the church was committed to monarchy and to and it was anti-democratic. But uh, the 20th century revealed the opposite, that, and especially since the Second Vatican Council. When does an authority act legitimately? 326. An authority acts legitimately when it works for the sake of the common... For, the common good and applies just methods of attaining the goals thereof. Well, of course, every group claims to be seeking the common good and the, the highest, the highest good. But often that's just a false claim. Uh, often the, the people of an empower are not interested in the common good, no, interested in their own power, in their own wealth, in, in their own advantages and are not interested in those of others. Although that's not fashionable to admit that. But often we see by the actions of, of people in power often that that is the way it is. So the, uh, the Christian in a democracy has the duty to uh, vote out people who are acting contrary to the true common good. So, and one of the problems is often people seek their own economic advantage over real justice or other advantages, the advantage of your particular ethnicity or class or the like. The people in a state must be able to rely on the fact that they are under a government of laws, which has rules that are binding on all, to equality before the law, 
And uh, no one is obliged to obey laws that are arbitrary and unjust, or that contradict the natural moral order. In that case, there is a right, or in some circumstances, even the duty to resist. Three twenty-seven. How can the common good be promoted? The common good follows wherever the fundamental rights of the person are respected, and men can freely develop their intellectual and religious potential. The common good implies that men can live in society with freedom, peace, and security. In an age of globalization, the common good must also acquire a worldwide scope and allow for the rights and duties of all mankind. So uh, crass jingoism and uh, nationalism, in which uh, all that matters is that we are dominant, that uh, uh, my country gets the benefits, and it, it, the, it doesn't matter that we're sucking all the resources out of particular countries and not putting anything back, and not acting in a way that's to be beneficial for people throughout the world. The common good is best served with the good of the individual person and of the smaller units of society, for instance, the family, is central. The individual and the smaller social unit need to be protected and promoted by the stronger power of state institutions. As, as Peter said in the book of Acts, we must obey God rather than men. What is the individual, what can the individual contribute to the common good? Question 328. Working for the common good means assuming responsibility for others. The common good must be the business of everyone. This happens, first of all, when men get involved in the particular surroundings, family, neighborhood, workplace, and take responsibility. It is important also to exercise social and political responsibility. Someone who assumes this sort of responsibility, however, wields power and is always in danger of misusing that power. Therefore, everyone in a position of responsibility is called upon to engage in the ongoing process of conversion so that he can exercise that responsibility for others in lasting charity and justice. And this is not only true in secular society, it's true in the church because there are people who can get positions of responsibility, but they use it for their own personal advancement and power, and rather than for the good uh, of all, rather than for, and, and, uh, our, uh, elective officials are called civil servants, and that's what they're supposed to be. But even more so in the church, as Jesus pointed out, said that the, the Gentiles lord it over others, but that is not the way with you. It's not supposed to act in that way. Yes, there's authority, and we have to, the people in authority have to say, thus says the Lord, and have to say, this is this, and, uh, and that's that, and uh, uh, that you don't like it is not relevant. So we have to stand up for the objective, the objective right and wrong and for, uh, for various other things as members of the church. And the temptation is to uh, compromise with people in power and then more and more and more compromise. And that we've seen this throughout history. Rather than to stand up for the gospel, stand up for, for uh, justice for all, stand up for uh, the, the natural law of God, to stand up for the rights of, of people as uh, members of the church. And uh, the principle of subsidiarity is a, talked about that, how that should be applied in the church as well. But, uh, but you can't go off on your own. So we're still seeing this now in Germany. There are uh, clergy and even bishops that seem to be, uh, have completely gone off the rails and are going off in a direction that's completely incompatible with with Catholic Christianity. And if their conscience really tells them that this is the way it is, then they should say, 
then we must leave the Catholic Church, if that's the case, rather than to say we have to take over the Catholic Church, which is what they were rather doing. Or trying to say, I'm going to stay in and I'm going to disobey the, uh, the teachings of the Church uh, openly uh, and uh, confront, confront that. So that's, uh, that's dishonest, actually. So It's one thing to say, we're, uh, we're going to confront the ways in which leaders and others in the church are not applying the doctrines of the church, not applying the morality of the church, not applying this. That's a prophetic stance. But the other way is the opposite. It's the way of the false prophet. How does social justice come about in the society? What, 329. Social justice comes about where the inalienable dignity of every person is respected and the resulting rights are safeguarded and championed without reservation. Among those, among these is also the right to active participation in the political, economic, and cultural life of society. The basis of all justice is respect for the inalienable dignity of the human person, whose defense and promotion have been entrusted to us by the Creator, and to whom the men and women at every moment of history are strictly and responsibly in debt. Pope St. John Paul II, in his encyclical Solicitudo Rei Socialis, published in 1987. Human rights are an immediate consequence of, the, of human dignity, and no state can abolish or change them. States and authorities that trample these rights underfoot are unjust regimes and lose their authority. A society is not perfected by laws, however, but rather by love of neighbor, uh, which makes it possible for everyone to look upon his neighbor without any exception as another self. Three eighty, three thirty, rather. To what extent are all men equal in God's sight? All men, and men here means men, women, children, are equal in God's sight insofar as they all have the same Creator. All are created in the same image of God with a rational soul, and all have the same Redeemer. Because all men are equal in God's sight, every person possesses the same dignity and has a claim to the same human rights. Hence, every kind of social racist, sexist, cultural, or religious discrimination against a person is an unacceptable injustice. Well, it's interesting that, uh, so, uh, ordination. So, if you, so, well, if you don't ordain women, then that's just pl plain sexist. But uh, there's a deeper issue with, see, the issue of ordination isn't an issue of right. I didn't have a right to be ordained. I can't say, well, I went to seminary, I went to all this, and stuff like that. I went to jump to the hoops. I have the right to be a day. Nobody does. It's, you're ordained to service, and it has to be through the discernment of the church. And uh, sometimes the people who are supposed to be making the sermon don't make good decisions, either to ordain or not to ordain someone. So we can't say, well, it's it, it's a... Uh, an issue of social justice for uh, uh, ordination of, of women or something. No, it's, that's a completely different story. It's a completely different <coughs> uh, issue because it, it, the issue is, is this the will of God? That's the question that has to be. And also, is this for the good of the whole church? Or would this be uh, terribly disruptive or whatever? They, these are questions that have to be addressed. And, uh, and dealt with <laughs> in the area of, of, the, of, of ordination, in the area of, 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 of anything, in fact. And there's also, you know, if I dissent from the doctrines of the church, uh, <clears throat> I don't have a right, I have a duty not to participate, not to not to be in a position of, of responsibility in the church. Yeah, I was reading online of this person 
and they, they just took integrity from him and said, uh, uh, I reject a number of the dogmas of the church. And so I told this to the priest, and, and he even said, I don't think I should be married in the Catholic Church because I have no intention of living any of this or doing any of these things. Uh, and the things that you know I want to do are contrary to the teachings of the church. And he was right. <clears throat> Why is there nevertheless injustice among men? All men have the same dignity, but not all of them meet with the same living conditions. In cases where injustice is man-made, it contradicts the gospel. In cases where men have been endowed by God with different gifts and talents, God is asking us to rely on one another. In charity, one should make up for what the other lacked. Not just in charity, but in justice. <clears throat> to, to, you know, to children who are going without uh, sufficient food or care or whatever like that, it's, that's an issue of justice, not an issue of charity. There is a kind of inequality among men that does not come from God, but rather originates in societal conditions. So there is inequality in different things, but inequality in talents, inequality in intellectual gifts, inequality in physical gifts, abilities, but all these, these things, there are inequalities. But we're still equal, no matter what. So you can't say that people are pushed aside. There was someone who would said, oh, uh, God didn't make people equal, all people equal. It was Jefferson who did. Of course, Jefferson didn't. Jefferson had no intention of, of freeing his slaves, of making his slaves equal to him. He wasn't into it. But God did. And so we have to apply the equality of God. And uh, the, the racism and classism and the, these other things are, are, can, are not compatible with Christianity. So, and, and especially the opposition to the right to life. So, you know, say you're deformed, well, you don't have a right to live. Well, with, in God, I do. It, the state doesn't give me the right to life. God gave me the right to life. And the state doesn't have the right to take uh, innocent life, no matter how, con uh, how uh, burdensome that may be. especially unjust distribution of raw materials, land and capital worldwide. So, you know, they, uh, so uh, the ruling class doesn't have the right to everything just because they inherited it or the power that kept them in kept. If, uh, there's the responsibility to everyone. Yes, the church defends the right of private property, it defends the right of human life as the highest uh, right. God expects us to remove from the world everything that is plainly contrary to the gospel and disregards human dignity. But there is another sort of inequality among men that is quite in keeping with God's will, inequality in talents, initial conditions, and opportunities. These are an indication that being human means there are others in charity so as to share and to promote life. So I have my talents, whatever they may be, and all that, not f primarily for my sake, but primarily for everyone's sake. Now, of course, it has to be applied first to me and then to my immediate circle of d dependence. But I have to be open to, to sharing in this for the sake of the world. Uh, question 332. How is the solidarity of Christians with other people expressed? Christians are committed to just societal structures. Part of this is universal access to the material, intellectual, and spiritual goods of this world. Christians also make sure that the dignity of human work is respected, which includes a just wage. 
Handed on the faith is also an act of solidarity with all mankind. Solidarity is the practical hallmark of a Christian. Practicing solidarity is not just a command of reason. Jesus Christ, our Lord, identified completely with the poor and the lowly. Matthew 25, 40. To refuse solidarity with them would be to reject Christ. So we'll stop there and talk about natural law, but not next Thursday, because that's Holy Thursday. We'll have uh, other, other devotions and things for that. And so we're doing the seven last words on Thursdays of Lent. And this is the sixth word. It is finished. John 19, 30. And the hymn, Jesus in thy dying throes. Jesus, all our ransom paid, all thy Father's will obeyed, by thy sufferings perfect made. Hear us, holy Jesus. Save us in our soul's distress. Be our help to cheer and bless. While we grow in holiness, hear us, holy Jesus. Brighten all our heavenward way with an ever holier ray till we pass to perfect day. Hear us, holy Jesus. John 19, A bowl full of vinegar stood there, so they put a sponge full of vinegar on itself and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus was given sour wine. This was not the necrotic drink that Jesus early refused. In Mark 15, 23. The use of hyssop to lift the sponge to Jesus suggests a connection with the original Passover, when the Israelites used hyssop branches to smear blood on their doorposts as a mark of divine protection. Exodus 12, 21 to 31. So it is finished, it is fulfilled. Telestatai. It is it is done. But it's not like uh, over and out of the way. It's completed. And so with this, Jesus has completed his mission of the Incarnation. Now, it will be ratified by the Resurrection, but the death is, is, the, is the height of all of this. And let's pray the Our Father together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let's see who's waving. Leslie Sinclair, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Larry Lewis, up there in Ontario, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Father Paul Ring, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Bob Henry, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Anna Matthews, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Kate O'Neill, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Bye now.